Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session about the climate emergency and the role of forest investments. My name is Alexandra Holmund, and I'm a Sweden-based forester with over 20 years of experience uh, in forest investments and operational forestry worldwide. Right now, I'm both a scientist and a practitioner. I research in innovative finance for biodiversity protection and restoration and work with impact investments for the benefit of climate and biodiversity. Today, we have a very knowledgeable panel here with us, all of which have valuable forest investment background um, from different angles, as well as experiences in different geographies, institutions and businesses. So I would like to introduce to you uh, Richard, Richard Boomer from Forbium, Petri Lechtonen from Partisip, Patrick Worms from World Agroforestry Center, and Daniel Paul Dima from uh, Porini Log. So I would like each and one of you to please say a few words about yourselves. So why don't you start, um, uh, Daniel, Paul, sorry, Paul. Daniel or Paul, equally works. Yeah. So uh, nice to be here with you. Hello to everyone who is watching this now. I'm a Romanian born uh, citizen, nowadays living in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, I'm a forester, almost 20 years of experience uh, running my own consultancy company from Helsinki. In the past uh, 15 years, working with uh, investors, mainly focusing on Southeastern Europe, but also with a keen interest on uh, sustainable mountain logging, because most of the forests and the future forests will still be in mountain areas, which are also very sensitive ones. So looking forward to a meaningful discussion today. Thank you. Petri, will you continue? Okay, hello, everybody. So I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, I have been working with uh, forestry over 35 years. I'm originally from Finland. And uh, today I'm actually living in, in Brussels. And uh, last two years I have been working for the Forest for the Future facility, which is managed by a consulting company, Partisip. And we are advising the European Commission on future forest interventions and my own area at the moment is especially to look how we could leverage more private investments into into the let's say supporting this goal sustainable climate resilient forestry thank, thank you. you thank you petri um richard hi everybody yeah, i'm um, i'm a passionate uh, defense of uh, to try to find a solution to uh, climate change. I, I manage a, a company that has half agricultural land, half forest land, trying to figure out how's the best way to produce biomass, as I think it's one of the uh, elements that's important in the fight of climate change. And uh, I, we're based in, uh, I'm based in Brussels, but uh, the company is based in Romania. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and we have Patrick. Thanks, Alexandra. Well, it seems that Brussels is the city to be in right now because I'm also based in Brussels. I am the uh, Senior Science Policy Advisor for World Agroforestry, which is headquartered in Nairobi, and for the Center for International Forestry Research, which is headquartered in Borgor in Indonesia. And I've been doing that for the last 10 years after a career in the corporate sector and the public sector, mostly dealing with environmental issues. What I do is uh, to operate at the interface between science and policy. Um, uh, C4 ICRAF is a science-based organization of over 700 staff studying how we can harness natural resources to improve the lives mostly of smallholders, mostly in tropical and subtropical countries, while taking into account and ideally rekindling, regenerating, if you like, the ecosystem services that we all depend on. Thank you very much, Patrick. That sounds very interesting. And given the, the, the diverse background of this panel, I would like to kick the panel off by asking a following question. Are the forest investments today going to the right targets if the aim is to mitigate climate change and adapt to it. And I'd like uh, Petri to start, but everybody else to comment. Okay, th th thank you very, very much. So first, what I think is that at least in the past, if, if we really look at the investments, I think this has not really happened. 
but I hopefully hope I'm kind of optimistic and I think that this is probably changing. So my first point is that if we think the conventional investments, timberland investments, which are dominating these forest investments, they are mainly targeted to existing assets, not really creating uh, new forests or, or new carbon stocks. So they are not really driving this change. They have not been really driving this change. And then another thing is that actually only marginal share of these investments have been really going to developing countries, emerging countries. Uh, it's mostly actually these investments have been still going to developed countries when we look at the statistics and not really places where deforestation and forest degradation is, is, is really alarming. I know that there is lots of pledges, investments, commitments, and now we, we talk about nature-based solutions and, and, and how that's an option, but it's still like in practice, still it's very limited in these target countries. And, and probably this is due to the very high perceived risks and uh, required scale. And, and yeah, so, so I think that uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. There is lots of commitments and talk that we should redirect these investments, but I think it's especially when we I'm talking about private investments. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I would make a comment. I say I would say that there's there's very little going on yet, but I think it's going to change massively because the price of CO two is going to have a huge impact. And I think I think it will probably be driven by the corporate sector that really needs to find solutions uh, to their for their resource if they have to replace fossil fuels. And I think that that will probably um, bring lots of new investors because they will probably follow the big corporates who will take care of all the um, operational aspects and will make these investments possible because it's very difficult for investors today to go into these new areas and these new sectors without having all the expertise and the expertise is not going to come from the institutional investor it's going to come from the corporate world uh, patrick i think you wanted to say yeah i i um, I would add to that that um, the focus, the exclusive focus on carbon is uh, a fool's errand. Uh, we need to take a holistic approach to these issues. And uh, when I was discussing these uh, investments with a global ethical finance initiative in Glasgow, the word that came back most frequently was integrity, by which was meant a multifactorial analysis that takes um, um, biodiversity and social issues into account. Um, I agree with, uh, with with Petri that the amount of money that's going to be flowing into this is going to to rapidly become a flood simply because of the sheer amount of institutional cash that is looking for a way to uh, to pursue what I call the St. Augustine strategy of climate change. Uh, famously, St. Augustine uh, uh, asked God to make him virtuous, but not quite yet. And much the same uh, is uh, happening in the world of, of modern industry. So the first step that many corporates are trying to do is to figure out a way of um, uh, mitigating their emissions by investing in nature-based solutions. And as we all know, the offer of potential nature-based solutions is, is not fast enough. It's not Thank enough. you. Thank you. Um, Paul. But, if, if, yeah. you know, oh, I just sorry. make a comment. No, there is a real... Yeah. But they, these people have a real necessity to find solutions to their problems of energy. And the demand is, is, gonna, is very big and has to be urgently met because it's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem, but I'll talk about it later. Yeah, I okay. wanted just to add that uh, I think we, we all agree that maybe 90% of all the funds, all the money available is somewhere in the US, Canada, European Union countries and Australia, New Zealand, while the biggest need for funding is somewhere in the tropical belt uh, as the first place to go, but then we shouldn't uh, somehow neglect uh, the temperate and the boreal areas of the planet because uh, as climate is changing and uh, it's changing faster than the, the, the poles, we might face uh, completely new, new challenges uh, for managing forests where used to know what to do and all of a sudden we are not sure so not so sure anymore. The, it's going to be interesting to, to see how things develop, uh, but I think that there is also a fracture or multiple fractures between north and south where the money is and the central part of the world uh, where the money is really needed as a first step. 
That's absolutely true. But in the South, what's often missing is the right poverty environment rather than the right, uh, the right cash. Um, we work in, in, in the tropical zone and we work with smallholder farmers and uh, across much of Africa, for example, the easiest way to enhance agricultural productivity is to get farmers to integrate trees into their farming systems. Um, that is potentially extremely useful from the perspective of the forestry industry since it can generate a substantial amount of the timber, the biomass that is required. But it will only work if there is a clear legal framework that gives farmers the tenure of those trees. And that, surprisingly enough, is very often lacking. So in, in many cases, the optimal solution for a farmer is to get rid of those trees, even though the farmer knows it will have a negative impact on productivity of their land, simply because the administrative uh, costs associated with having trees in the landscape are so high. And I think that's an issue that in the forestry world generally is probably under-recognized. Absolutely. So if we discuss a little bit um, forestry industry and carbon sequestration and biodiversity, if we look at the three, uh, all three are needed in one way or another, but how do we integrate the three? Does anybody want to jump on the question? I'd, I'd love to, with an, ex, with an extremely provocative statement. The easiest way of integrating the tree is to crack open a cold beer, find a comfortable chair, and watch the landscape regenerate itself. Um, what the science suggests is that, especially when you take the low ground uh, interactions into account, the easiest and the fastest way and the cheapest way of getting a combination of carbon and biodiversity back into the landscape is to let nature take over again. That brings us a foundational problem, of course. The forestry industry is not in the business of running nature parks. The forestry industry is in the business of providing the biomass that, that we all need. And being almost 8 billion on this planet and becoming increasingly richer, we are going to need a lot more biomass. I completely agree with you, Richard, on this, on this front. So how do, we, how do we square that particular circle? And, and that's where agroforestry is such a promising um, uh, resource. It, it turns out that adding trees to agricultural landscapes works in almost any farming system and will increase the productivity of almost any farming system. The total factor productivity of land that integrates trees rises, means it produces more biomass. Some of that biomass is crop or, or livestock, but some of that biomass is timber or, or fiber. Um, so I, I strongly suspect that as the world is pushing for the conservation of, um, of natural forests, as it is moving, as the industry is moving away from the uh, monoclonal, uh, monospecies plantations of fast growing trees simply because these are becoming increasingly fragile in an environment in which climate cannot be dependent on any longer, that the forestry industry will partner with farmers to put more and more of the trees that it requires into farming landscapes. Petri. I, okay, yeah, I, I fully, I mean, I largely agree with what Patrick said, but I would like to add to this that like if we just look at the situation now, and uh, if we think uh, many of the developing countries, for example, Africa, um, actually these many of these countries are like how the wood is used. It's burnt, or then when it's processed, it's, it's processed very badly and producing lots of waste. So the first thing is that if we have sustainable forest industries in place, we can have the rule that we can use, use, do more from less. And many of these countries, actually the demands are growing. There is more demand for uh, all kinds of structural timbers, etc. I mean, if you think about the urban centers, for example, in Africa, the demand is growing and, uh, and maybe these products can substitute, I mean, many, many kind of uh, materials which are based on fossil, fossil, fossil materials. So that, and many of these countries have be, become now net importers of these products. And at the same time, they are also exporting like blocks to Asia and so on. So I think that key is that there is actually a huge potential in many of these emerging countries to, to increase the value added, but not necessarily sacrificing the resource, but increasing the value added, using the wood more efficiently to better purposes and always hopefully for long-term purposes. And I think on the other hand, at the same time, it's actually very critical that these investments, I mean, they are long-term investments. So actually the resource base has to be resilient 
and I fully agree with Patrick that that's also something that when it's a plantation based, the plantation based should be diversified towards agroforestry, towards more diversified systems in the landscapes. There are many options. And then when it comes to natural forest, we have to be, of course, very cautious how, whether they are protected, conserved, or if it's used, it will be very cautious how they will be used. So that's, that's my view. Richard. Yeah, I must say something that um, it's great to talk about uh, biodiversity, about carbon capture, and these are very important subjects all, clearly for everybody. But the reality, what I'm finding today is that I'm finding myself in front of industries in Europe, I'm talking, because this is specific for Europe, who have a marginal cost of energy today. If you've looked at the prices of energy, nobody's talking about that, but this is just my major. I mean, people were, the cost of energy was around for all these big industries, you know, cement, uh, big chemical chemistry, uh, steel, uh, well, I mean, district heatings, their cost of energy was around three euros a gigajoule just a few uh, years ago. And now we're talking about cost of energy of 11 to, to 25 euros a gigajoule. I can tell you that I've received calls and mails from industries asking to, um, to to provide biomass in huge quantities at prices that would make your eyes pop out. Uh, the world has changed absolutely incredibly. And the, the problem we have today is far beyond all the, you know, our, our subject of biodiversity and everything is that we, we, these people have a real problem. They, are, they need heat on demand. There is no technology out there to give the solution. You can ask uh, people to say, okay, you have to have a renewable energy, but where's that renewable energy going to come from? And for the moment, most of the industries, their only solution is biomass. So what we need to do is clearly invest massively with these people and produce as much as we can. And I think that uh, obviously we need to do it sustainably with uh, try to mix in biodiversity. But the, the, the real issue today is how are we going to solve this energy problem? Because if we don't solve this energy problem, nothing's going to change on the CO2 front. So, um, yeah, Richard, I, if you I, may... I, I, would just, I, oh. I would just add there that there are solutions to that from the agroforestry world, mm -hmm. uh, which actually produce an enormous quantity of biomass in a very short time. These are the so-called short rotation coppice systems that have been trialed in East Germany, in England, amongst other places, and where farmers that are arable farmers are putting alleys of at extremely high densities, up to 100,000 trees per hectare down, and harvesting them using harvesters to make pellets uh, um, every two or three years. Um, you help with biodiversity issues that way, simply because you're adding to the biodiversity what was previously a monoculture farm, and you are also suddenly having access, if you can convince farmers to move into those production systems, you suddenly have access to millions of, extra, of hectares of extra land, which you cannot turn into forests for all sorts of, uh, uh, of legal reasons, and which are still classified as agricultural land, while giving you the biomass that your clients require. So that's probably something that really needs to be explored. It seems to me to be right now the lowest hanging fruit in terms of the cost of getting it down, the legal difficulty of getting it down, and the speed with which you can harvest the result. No, but this is exactly what we're doing in Romania, is we're, we're, we're doing agroforestry, we're planting energy crops, but to convince a farmer to plant uh, energy crops, a tree, is like, you know, it took me years to get them to actually take care of them. I mean, for them, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a weed, you know, it's, yeah, and absolutely. so there's, there's, a, there's a whole cultural barrier, and uh, it's, it's not easy, and, you know, but we need to multiply what we're doing by a million, and it's not happening fast enough. Oh, you yeah, just to... wanted to yeah, just wanted to build on what uh, the other said that uh, well, right now uh, the agriculture seems to be the biggest enemy of the forestry or of the forest. So now we need to bring two enemies somehow together to make them friends to, to discuss about agroforestry at the global level, especially in those uh, developing countries which definitely needs to to find energy because you cannot talk about the industry or you cannot hope for the industry that Petri mentioned without having energy for those mills. Doesn't matter if it's just saw milling or wood panels or construction or whatever industry, no energy, no, need, no nothing. So it's uh, uh, very challenging to, to, to come up there with uh, fast enough solutions, especially in those countries and those areas where the uncontrolled population growth happens basically. According to United Nations, we expect to get another 3 billion people in Africa alone in the next eight years. 
these people who need such a tremendous yeah, amount of energy I, I, that I, it's complicated sorry, was to see something. I, yeah, I, I, work, I, I work in Africa <laughs> and have been doing that for a long time, and I want to push back on this particular idea. The reason why we have so many people on the planet is not because Africans are breeding like rabbits. The reason why we have so many people on the that. planet is because each and every one of us is growing much, much older because child mortality has gone right down. And everywhere in the world, you see the same thing happening. In our families, in Romania, in Belgium, two generations ago, people typically have five or six children per woman. Now it's down to less than two. You see the same thing happening in the last 20 years in places like Indonesia or India or Bangladesh or Iran or Egypt or Tunisia. In fact, almost everywhere in the world, the last place left where people still have six or seven children per woman is in West Africa and in Ethiopia. That's pretty much it. And even there, the number is going down. So that's a problem that's going to solve itself at a time scale of a century or more, simply because a baby born today is likely to live until he's 80 or so. Um, and that's something that we cannot do anything about. We simply have to deal with the energy demands and the material demands of a growing population, most of which has already been born. I agree with you. You say that they are breeding like rabbits. Just wanted to pinpoint that the need for energy will be especially there because there will be most of the people living in the world in that tropical belt. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. So I believe Petri wanted the word. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to say that, especially now this is a little bit related to these agroforestry systems, when you say that it's producing lots of biomass, uh, I, that's good, that's good. But at the same time, I think it's important that, that we will think about this, let's say, if we think about wood, so we can have like such regimes that, that we will kind of have long-term, long rotation, trees with, with more value and probably that's actually going very well nicely with agroforestry because then you can the smallholders can actually take the accept this long gestation period because they are getting all the revenues from multiple products and they can have actually in the long term also very valuable uh, high value products that will be later on feeding to the to the let's say uh, to the, to the processing. And this is just one thing that from the kind of forest owner's perspective, it's important that we have such industries that have high wood paying capacity also. So, so of course I, I don't, it's, it's just good to keep in mind that they, they have a high wood, wood paying capacity because they are doing high value products and that they can, use, they can use the wood efficiently. And always like there is room for bioenergy in this, in this, let's say, kind of circularity that we always can use the residues for this, just to keep this in mind. Thank you. But we're actually starting to receive some questions from the audience. And we have a question from Sean here, uh, who is uh, saying that there is a lack of clear information about the forest industry. Media sometimes states that it's bad for the environment. How would the panel address this lack of accurate information? Richard. Yeah, very quickly, I think that there's there's good biomass and bad biomass. And I think uh, a lot of people are criticizing bad bi biomass. And uh, obviously, nobody wants to deforest. So nobody wants to cut down to clear cut too much. I mean, it's just something you don't want to do. So we're talking here in this panel about good biomass. That means sustainably produced without, you know, keeping your carbon stock over a reasonable time period or even increasing your carbon stock. So it depends what we're talking about. And if you look at all the criticism, most of the criticism for this um, biomass is actually mostly um, the bad biomass part. But we, none of us want that bad biomass, clearly. And so it's a question of you know, clearly defining what we're talking about. And here, when I say good biomass is the one it's produced sustainably without destroying the carbon stock, clearly. Petri. If I can add to this, like, Exactly. There are good and there are bad, unfortunately. I mean, that's the situation. And, and, but if I, if I think uh, today and tomorrow and think about the good part, we have responsible uh, forest industry companies. It's a, it, it, you have to make very big long-term investments and you have to leave You have to also kind of have a social acceptability for that. So I think that there is an inherent interest to, to, to have, a, first of all, 
when you do these big investments, you, ha you have to know that there is a kind of resource base for long term. So there is this interest. And if, if we have like uh, good companies, they also understand that actually we are having a climate change taking place and probably there has to be lots of mitigative. We have to mitigate that. We have to have a kind of resilient supply chain. And this resilient supply chain means that we have to think about this twice. So I would say that there are lots of good about that. But in the past, we have to also accept all the lessons learned from the past, which were not probably that positive. I don't know um, if that... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I believe Patrick wanted to say a yeah. word too. Yeah, I think I, I, um, Sean is asking a really good question and Richard made a good point. Uh, nobody wants bad biomass. Well, that's untrue. There are a lot of people who profit from bad biomass and who are selling bad biomass. And right now in the public right. mind, those bad actors are lumped together with the good actors into one amorphous blob called the forestry industry. Um, getting out of that particular issue is not going to be easy. Just think of the nuclear industry, for example. I mean, like a lot of people, I believe nuclear power is essential in the age of climate change. But because of the mishandling of uh, the communications around uh, nuclear power and its accidents, uh, that technology has mostly been banished by in, in large parts of the world. Forestry has to be careful that the same thing doesn't happen to it. What would I recommend? Um, a stronger push by reputable forestry, which is the majority, the vast majority of companies, players and landowners to distinguish themselves from the bad biomass actors and perhaps a, a very public commitment to work together with regulators, for example, in the European Union, to ensure that it is harder to put bad biomass into the market. Because right now, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, because this is not my area of expertise, um, the mix, it's, it's relatively easy to mix the bad biomass with the good biomass when it comes to an energy plant. Um, that may help to uh, 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 push the positive media stories about a responsible forestry industry, which the industry needs for its social license to operate. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Yeah, I think that what Patrick wants to say, please correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, to have an approach like name and shame. Basically, those who are the wrongdoers, we should pinpoint them, bring them up. I believe that we live in a time when information and communication technology and the social media can help in, in uh, asking accountability, both from the industry, but also from the governments, because also at government level, I, I see that there is no, no uh, basically accountability every two or four years, according to different kinds of the regimes installed uh, in different countries, which are important ones at the global level, uh, policy towards climate, towards investments, towards uh, sustainability changes overnight, sometimes 180 degrees, as we have seen after the Paris uh, meeting in 2015. So um, I think that people should really ask for more accountability from, from their so-called or real leaders. If I can... Richard. Okay. Oh, so, sorry, Petri, go ahead. No, no, just to elaborate to this, that mm -hmm. I think that uh, we are having lots of regulations which are coming, like, for example, European regulations are, are, are coming up, and I think other countries follow. Probably these regulations will not solve <laughs> the problems, but at least, like, if we have this, if we have proactive good companies, they will manage better when, when, when the markets are regulated, those who are doing good, like I fully agree with Patrick, but uh, Patrick that actually those private sector companies who are kind of uh, want to do the good thing and they are cooperating with regulators, they will have also a comparative advantage in future. That's that. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm reading now, uh, we've just got a bunch of um, uh, questions coming in. Um, and one question that I, kind of would like to hear your opinion on is regarding exotic species uh, used in plantations. Here, uh, there is a, a question about eucalyptus. What does the panel think? Is it okay to consider species that have a severe impact on local biodiversity? And the mention is in eucalyptus. Also myself, I've heard, well, I have been asked personally several times, what do I think about paulonia in different areas? So um, what does the panel think about exotic species uh, for plantations? Paul? I think that uh, <clears throat> depending on the geography, uh, 
implantations are most likely going in those areas we talked about earlier. When there is fast growing and fast returns ahead. Um, going monospecies comes with a big risk attached. In introducing uh, exotic species, what do, you what do you understand by exotic species which don't exist naturally in those types of forest in that environment? Then you come also with some uh, something uh, risky because uh, the dingo was not uh, came as an exotic stuff in Australia, and uh, there was some uh, consequences afterwards. The same can happen if you introduce some tree species or any other kind of vegetation in an environment which is absolutely new and unprepared, and then uh, you might destabilize it. So uh, I would always go myself towards the natural forests, natural species proven by nature that they work there, even though it might not come with the same returns for investors. Any more comments? Anybody else? Patrick. Exotics are the bane of our lives as agroforesters, especially in Africa. It doesn't matter where you go in the tropics, um, you will find eucalyptus, grevillea, mangoes, guavas, avocados. Um, a very, very limited number of species that have taken over the landscape. And you can understand why farmers plant them. Eucalyptus grows really quickly and there's a ready market for it. Um, if you look at East Africa, for example, Amelia species provide timber that's as good as uh, eucalyptus, but the rotation is 30% longer. So why would the farmer have to wait 30% long more time to make money than using this exotic? So here, I think the solution is not one that can come from the forestry industry because with, uh, um, I'm sure, Paul, you would agree with me to say that, yes, it would be a wonderful world in which investors choose to leave some money on the table in order to pick a local species rather than an exotic species, but we don't live in such a world. We live in a world in which people usually try to maximize their income. And the way to do that, uh, it seems to me, would be to work much more closely with the financial industry so that the value that the world attaches to using native species, to using locally adapted species, which is not reflected in the price that the farmer can get or in the rotation period that the farmer has to work with, is reflected in a payment for ecosystem services. And I think that the technologies we have available today, ranging from mobile payment to blockchain, should allow us to develop such financial products that would allow the interests of the farmers, the foresters, and the wider community to become more closely aligned to ensure that the exotics don't take over the world. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask some more questions here from the panel uh, connected to good or bad biomass. So I've got two questions about this uh, good or bad biomass. First, what is good or bad biomass? And second, uh, is there any certification for good biomass? Richard? Well, as I said before, the good biomass is the one where you have, you actually don't, you keep your carbon stock over a reasonable period of time. Um, and you follow obviously uh, certain sustain sustainability um, criteria. Um, the, um, the issue about certification about I would say is I don't see I don't know any of any because you know finding out what your carbon stock is today and actually seeing calculating its evolution is actually very complex and I'm waiting till somebody will come with a satellite that will tell me every year what is my carbon stock exact carbon stock because that would be um, the best way to do it it's not that easy to it, it, the we concept can do it in is Africa. important call us well Sorry, if Patrick. you can give me the technology because. <laughs> We've been we've been discovering that we had uh, far more wood than we thought uh, just by when we started harvesting our uh, poplar trees. So, it's 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 not that easy to know what your exact stock is. But that is clearly something that's coming. I don't think the certifications today include carbon, and th that's an issue that needs to be handled in the in the future. But clearly, that is uh, is very important. And for me, you know, good biomass is the one that doesn't deplete the carbon stock. Um, and regarding biomass uh, for energy, um, uh, that we, we have a comment here, shouldn't it be the last resource uh, resort used for wood, i.e. Uh, shouldn't we prioritize use of wood for something else than energy, given the, the, the climate crisis we're in? I, okay, yeah. well, I think that, like thinking now, like, whoever owns the forest and let's say 
smallholders and all, all the value chain, I think we should always have the wood for the most valuable use. That's actually benefits everybody, but it, it takes a long term. So first of all, when you have a high value use for wood, the owner will get the highest, I mean, much better price. And then, but, but we have to remember here that the kind of competitive edge for the industry is, is that, okay, let's say that they, they have some high value products, let's say whatever furniture or, or some, some uh, construction materials for high, long-term high value purposes. There is always one part is residues that we, and maybe we can use the residues again for something else. But, but I would say that if we can, we would, the, the last bits and bits pieces are for then bioenergy and, and there are good solutions for bioenergy. I mean, that's the way in the long term, it would be the most beneficial way to do it. But of course we have exceptions. We have a, different situations in practice where we have lots of needs, but I would say that that would be the aim, that mm. we always have the best possible use for the very valuable raw material. And I, I must say that the, even the word biomass, that the, everything we have actually beautiful, it sounds, it's, it's a little bit like <laughs> putting down the beautiful, uh, valuable raw material that we can have in our hands. Yeah, I'm Thank all for that. Right, Paul. I just wanted to, to bring in the discussion, maybe the role of technology, because for instance, let's take India. They are burning annually maybe 350 million cubic meters of wood out of the 400 million they are using in total. Uh, it makes a big difference if the efficiency in producing energy, either thermal electricity or both, when you burn so much wood. So. If we put the technology at the right use, we might get more from less. If we keep on doing things with 25, 13, 15, 10% uh, uh, thermal energy efficiency, then we might just heat up the, the atmosphere and that's it. So I, I would look into technological solutions as well. Patrick. I would uh, um, support what Petri and Paul have just said. I mean, this is a holistic issue. And what we do in agroforestry is we tend to, to, to work with farmers to plant trees that provide a range of services of which biomass for energy is just one. Um, whether that is in the form of a, a coppicing system in Europe for a biomass to energy plant, or just for a few tweaks for the kitchen fire somewhere in Africa. Um, um, Richard, you made the point that uh, you would love to have a monitoring system that allows you to understand uh, how your management of the landscape is impacting the carbon stocks in that landscape. I know that in Europe we don't really have such a tool, but we have such a tool in Africa simply because we have been monitoring sentinel landscapes across the continent for 40 years now. We have hundreds of thousands of soil samples in our library in Nairobi, and these can be reanalyzed as analytical machinery gets better and better. Um, these have been measurements that have not just been made close to the surface, but at depth. That means we can understand how carbon stocks are changing across soil horizons. And because we have such long trend lines, we can use that to inform um, analytical engines, machine learning, if you like, uh, so that when we analyze satellite imagery, we are now in a position to actually give you very, very accurate predictions about what each particular pixel is like across over 20 different variables to a degree of precision that would blow your socks off. Um, that's the value of having looked at these issues for a very long period of time. And I hope that we can multiply this kind of approach on other parts of the world as well. Yeah, I, I yes, hope please. so. Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment. I agree with you and I hope to too, but I want to make a comment on the energy side. I think that obviously it would be great to use wood first for for making products and then recycle the wood into energy because that would you, you use every piece of wood twice once to make something and once to make energy that would be the ideal world but uh, you have to look at local situations but Bi biomass wood wood and, and biomass is a very local thing i think transporting the other side of the earth doesn't make much sense so every local area has a different uh, problem and uh, it, sometimes it's better to use it as energy locally than transporting it far away to make products. So you I, I think there's not one rule. You have to be very um, open to all kinds of possibilities. And uh, 
you know, and price will determine what will be the one, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the use. I think that, and I believe that energy will be defining the, the value of wood in the future and uh, all the other products will be defined on energy plus. That's my opinion. And I think it, uh, I, because the demand from energy is gonna be so strong and it's the most important thing in our society. Richard, to uh, continue on that note, uh, what, how do you think, how will the demand for timber, fiber and other woody biomass be met in the future? How can we do that? Oh, well, <laughs> I think it's every square meter of land that is not used uh, properly today, we should plant. And I can tell you, I've been through, I, I'm, I, I'll talk about Europe, but I'm sure it's the same all over the world. There's so much land that we're not using efficiently today in, in Europe, it's just unbelievable. Just Romania, and it's just quite amazing how much land is not used. There's a lot of agricultural land that's very, that's not used very well and where is not producing very much. And it's, there's so much we can do to, um, to increase productivities and uh, at the same time produce more food and more biomass. This is what we've been trying to do in the last 10 years is to show that you actually can take a, a situation and improve it substantially uh, on, in both directions. And I think the solution is that, is taking every square meter of land and seeing how we can optimize it um, to produce more while making, while thinking of biodiversity, while thinking of all the other aspects, which are very important. You, and you can do it all together. Sorry, say yeah, that again. You just described the promise of agroforestry, more biomass, meaning more food, more timber, more fiber, more soil carbon, more biodiversity. You can actually have your cake and eat it if you manage landscapes properly. And we can only do it if investors invest massively. And it's a hugely capital intensive industry. I would say there's something else that's missing. Uh, which is that right now it's a lot easier for a farmer to receive advice on how to use pesticides or improve seeds or mechanization than it is to receive advice on how to integrate trees into his production system. The worlds of agroforest, the worlds of forestry and agriculture are separated. And as long as these worlds don't start talking to one another, it's going to be very, very hard for operators like you to actually do the job of mixing it all up for all the benefits that we've just been discussing. Okay, so Paul and then uh, Petri. Yeah, just wanted to say that uh, we dis we've been discussing about biomass and about carbon, which uh, one way or another will be able to monetize always. In an earlier panel, I asked the question about how you monetize biodiversity. Mm. And uh, people dealing with investments uh, at large scale, they had no idea how to answer that. There is no monetization of biodiversity right now. And that's something that we need to consider. Mm. Thanks. Petri. Okay, very quickly. So I, I fully agree that agroforestry is, is one excellent solution. Of course, there are other solutions. But on, on the side of that, I think that we need efficient, better use of wood. And then we have to keep in, in mind that uh, when you say that planting these trees to agroforest systems, actually the best incentive is that when the farmers know that there is the market for these products. But that's what I have learned myself, also working a lot in Africa and other places. So that, that's yeah, why I right. want to emphasize this value chain part. And that's sometimes forgotten also. That's great. And I'm just about to say that we are about to finish our panel. So if we get cut off, you know why. <laughs> We're just some seconds away. So any last comments from the panel? Plant, plant, plant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and plant uh, perhaps... the right species. That's it. And perhaps agroforestry will eventually develop into a new climate investment segment. Or what do you say, Patrick? It, it already is. Um, it already you'd is. be surprised at the number of calls I get from investors and banks all wanting right now the demand for agroforestry projects for carbon place and for production place is much, much higher than the supply of agroforestry projects out there. It's a market ready for the taking. That's very interesting. Well, um, then we have to co connect the, um, the farmers with the industry. That's the next big thing, I suppose, uh, to That's connect the right. value chains, yes. And uh, to bring also investments, I suppose, into the forest industry where it yet doesn't exist. 
Uh, I know that uh, that's something that uh, Petri has been discussing at length. Do you want to say for a few words about that, Petri? Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, the thing is that I think that we have more or less said what we we want. We just have to keep in mind that that uh, it's 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 of course it's not only for it's not only wood industries. So it's also the other processing other products. But let's let's keep that in mind that we need need more efficient use of wood and there are always best to have the highest value of products and I think that it can nurture also better production systems like agroforestry when we have a right. good demand. So I, think, I have to thank you there because we're apparently over time now so thank you very much everybody and thank you for joining us. Okay thank you. Thank you. Take good care.